Thanks for staying around for this special session. This is on the Net Models Consortium. And again, I talked about it a little bit this morning. It's a special group that we're going to try and generate interest, energy, and some willingness for participation from our community to get together, to work together, and to form uh, working groups, which is the purpose pretty much of what this is going to be for the session, and to see if we can start tackling some of the problems and issues that uh, have faced the community for many, many years. We have our presenters and moderators. Our moderators are Dawn and Justin. They're going to give not detailed things about the models. This is just to get a flavor for all the models that are in the net community kind of at this time. And I think it's actually quite impressive what there is. But there's a lot of work that has to be done with them and to move beyond them. So I'll leave that with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, there are a lot of models. And the purpose of us beginning and sort of introducing the topic before the discussion is to just hopefully inspire more thought and, and ideas from everybody or contributions like, hey, I've got this model that complements something that we're lacking in the field. So what I wanted to do is just run through a couple of different PNET type of models, mostly. And then others will talk about animal models, organoids, different types, and for different nets. So we do have a limitation in, uh, in available human PNET cell lines. Primarily have these three that are listed here that most people are familiar with, with Bond and QGP1 being around for 30, 40 years, and NT3 coming along uh, more recently. The Bond and QGP1 are non-functional status, and NT3 are insulinoma derived, and, and they have different uh, grades. The NT3 are low grade, whereas Bond and QGP1 are criticized because they're so high grade. I would argue that their status is more like a high grade net because of their RB activity is wild type, but that's a debate uh, among people who use them and don't love them. And, and there are conflicting data out there, genetic and biologic, because I think people have them. We grow them in our labs, and it's no fault of our own, but they change over time. And so we can have differences among our cell lines. There is this recent paper that just came out in September, and also from Joerg Schrader's group who developed NT3 cells. And there we have three more pancreatic net on the right-hand side that are recurrence, a liver met, or the primary tumor. And so that's pretty interesting. And they also developed a large cell and a small cell neck on the left-hand side. And all of them are high grade. And so if you can see the look up Viol et al, and you'll, you'll find that paper if you haven't seen it yet. But they, they represent some new lines people could be working with. So they had these new lines, and uh, they looked at some drug responses in them, and they showed the efficacy of inhibiting ATR and aurora kinases in DAX and ARID1A deficient cells. Uh, I wanted to just throw in this slide because our Broad colleagues couldn't be here. They're having their own retreat at the same time. But they have worked on generating net cell lines, and some of them are longer term, like the first two that are shown there. And they've been able to expand them and verify them pretty well. And they want to deposit them, or they already have deposited, oh, in December 22. So next month, they'll deposit them to DSMZ. The other three are still under work in progress, and uh, two from the small intestine and one from the pancreas for those that are in progress. But there is a site to try and look at their portal to gain more info about it. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And if anybody wants to see these slides after, you're welcome to get them. People are definitely focused on developing tumoroids, spheroids, organoids, and we kind of had this discussion of what is the definition of these. I think it still needs to be clarified. But uh, yeah, so from this study from April Mon et al, uh, from Simon, he, they had generated grade two mainly, but also grade three tumoroids. And they looked at EZH2, the methyltransferase expression, and you can see it's quite differential. They also then looked at the sensitivity to EZH2 inhibitors, and it actually didn't correlate at all with the level of EZH2. So 
complexity, and we do need to learn a lot more, but we can certainly gain the more that we're able to generate these models and hopefully share them with each other. Poe has already talked about the 3D net spheroids that they've generated. They made some PNET, but majority were small bell net, and then there were also some NEC. And as she mentioned, uh, those that were more responsive to drugs were the PNET and NECs, whereas the SPNETs were more resistant. Then colleagues at NIH, so is Brianna here, I think, maybe? But uh, Brianna, Shiresh, Nitin Roper, and Heidi Del Rivero, they've generated organoids, and they are all low grade. So these are all KI67, less than 3%. Uh, which is pretty cool. So this addresses a, an area of need is we want organoids that are going to be low KI67. They have them from different sites, the colon, small bowel, pancreas, and they can't keep them going all that long, but they are very excited about doing collaborations and doing drug response assays. So uh, we've sent them our CDK4 and MEK inhibitors to look at their response to those. And they would encourage you to reach out to them and see if there are things that you want to test with them, get in touch with them, and they'll try and do it as soon as they have these because they're constantly generating them. There are a variety of mouse models of PNETs as well as all nets. And actually, there's a nice review uh, by uh, Heidi Del Rivero's group with Andrew Sedlak that just got accepted in cancers. So it has long lists of tables, uh, historical of all the different net mouse models as well as other types of models. I have only identified a few. We certainly need to talk about we need more PDXs. Uh, as far as xenografts, and we, a number of us have made bioluminescent cells so that we can track the tumors non-invasively over time. The RIPTAG model, that's controversial in a sense because it's, it's the first model from 1985. It's aggressive insulinoma. Um, it doesn't have active P53 or RB, so that makes it very grade 3 or neck-like. But it's been really, really helpful in the field. And um, I think you see from Minna's talk that it was very helpful in doing the crosses with AB6 mice and getting these, this metastatic model. So I'll just walk through a couple things. PDXs, we really only have two PNET PDXs that have been reported, and only one from Eric Nakakora's group with the Chamberlain et al. study, where it was a well-differentiated PNET, lower grade, I think Eric might say that they also can change over time as you keep them in the mice, um, which is a struggle for this entire, uh, first, can you even get the PDXs to form, and second, can you keep them the way they were at the very beginning? Uh, but this was a, a really fantastic study, and we need more. In my group, we made these bioluminescent PNET models, and it was kind of interesting. QGP1 Luke, even if you inject them in the tail vein, they'd home to the liver instead of going to the lung. Uh, so there could be something to that, as most of our nets metastasize to the liver. And so maybe we can learn something from that, even though these are uh, quite altered cell lines. Uh, of the genetically engineered mouse models, or GEMS, there are a lot. And we had done a review, but not nearly as extensive as uh, Heidi Del Rivero's review that's coming out. And uh, the RIPTAG2 model has been crossed with lots of others, or people have used the rat insulin promoter to drive expression of their different genes. In our study, we crossed them with an oncogenic protein, RAVL6A, with mice that lack that. And we, we slowed the progression a little bit and slowed the angiogenic switch a little bit. So they can be really useful depending on what your questions are. And then I just wanted to highlight uh, Zhi Zheng Wan and Steve Labuti's model with the PDX1 Cree Men1 P10 double knockout and how they have accelerated formation of insulinoma. But also, what's really cool is that 80% of them are going to form metastases if you wait long enough, if you age them out. And I don't know how long, but Zhi Zheng can hopefully comment maybe until they're like 10 or 12 months, you get a lot more metastases. Okay. And they'll be both lymph node as well as liver. And then I was just going to stop here highlighting what, what James had talked about earlier with CDK5 being overexpressed in pretty much all different nets. 
and how they had this insulin driven and doxycycline inducible PNET model where you can get both functional and non-functional nets. And we're excited to then take those and put them back into wild type mice so that you have syngeneic allografts that you can take one tumor, put them in 10 mice, and then those 10 can go to 100 mice. And then you can actually do properly powered uh, drug studies. So I think that's it for me. And I'm going to turn it over to Talia. So thank you, Don, for that overview. I guess I'm, I'm just going to quickly go over uh, the PDTO models that I've generated. But as I was watching Don's talk, I realized there are PDTO models that I haven't mentioned uh, that were published, I think, in 2020 or 2021 from Toshi Sato's lab in Japan. So they actually have generated uh, patient-derived tumor organoids from grade three pancreatic nets, as well as, I think, a couple other GP nets. And they also have neck PDTO. So just throwing that out, though, those are also models for people who are interested in more the GP uh, subtype. The ones that I've generated are low grade and intermediate grade. We are calling them intermediate grade, but that's sort of maybe uh, not established yet. For lung nets, and these are, we have atypical and typical carcinoids as well as this one super carcinoid. And then we have several LC necks from different tissue sites. And, you know, I just want to highlight that you know, we're talking about the differences between organoids and spheroids and tumoroids, and I think I can't tell you exactly because I don't know enough about the other models, but I'll just talk about our organoid models and what our goal was in generating these models was to have something like a cell line that's propagating and has sort of indefinite propagation capability. So our goal wasn't to propagate long enough to do drug tests, but to propagate long enough to do experiments multiple times and many different kinds of things. So so that's really, when, when I talk about organoids, that's what I'm I'm talking about. And so that's why also on here I haven't mentioned the SI net, um, I guess let's call them tumoroids, uh, spheroids, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to call them. But you know, I wasn't able to propagate them past passage four, but we have them. We have these cells. We have them frozen down. Uh, we're going to go back to them and try to learn from them. But just talking about the LNET, the PDTOs and the LCNECs that I've generated, I've sort of put down some of the kinds of questions that I think we can ask. Are, you know, even Don mentioned, we want models of NET that have low KI-67. But if they have low KI-67, they're not growing very much in culture, right? That doesn't mean they're a bad model, but it means they're difficult to work with. We can't ask the same questions we can ask with the high grades. So I've sort of listed, in my view, what I think these low-grade net models would be useful for. So for example, mechanisms of progression. So can we push them to become higher grade? Or can we mimic sort of these tumors that do eventually metastasize? Can we understand that process? I think that's something we can use these models for. And of course, I'm interested in looking at their growth factor dependencies. So those are just my ideas for what I think we can use them for. I don't think that these models are amenable for doing high throughput drug screening. I think Poe's models, I think uh, uh, Patricia's models, for example, those are, they, this is what they've done, and they've shown that they're very useful for that. Uh, the ones from uh, Ilaria Marinoni's lab, of course, also, I mean, all of these are, are, they just have different purposes, and we need to think about that and, and not equate one model with the other. What We need to use the models that are relevant to the questions we're asking. Um, and then for the LCNEC, of course, those are more, they're fast growing, and I think we can do all sorts of different studies. There's a lot more room there. And I do want to say that We've generated these models. The point is to share them with the community so they can be shared. Because of the regulations around using patient tissue, we do require that everyone who uses them gets ethical approval and has MTAs, et cetera. So there is a process, but it's, we can do it. We'll work on it, right? So just reach out if, if you're interested in using any of these models. And just throwing it out there for the nets, because they grow so slowly, that will be more difficult for me to generate enough to share broadly. But you know, let's work together, figure it out, see what's possible. Yeah, and I guess with that, I don't, I think Mike is next, yes. Well, thank you for this opportunity um, to be here and presenting our organoid platform that we established in Sorani Lab <laughs> in UCLA. Um, we use this organoid platform to screen a different number of tumor organoid samples. And here I'm going to discuss about the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma um, organoids that we establish in our lab in collaboration with Patricia Daya Lab in the University of Texas Health San Antonio. So as I'm sure that a lot of 
you know tomorrow organoids are three-dimensional models of disease that can be easily established from primary cells and then ma they maintain um, different cell types and cell cell interactions in culture and they also can recapitulate patient drug responses so with our approach we use a very few number of cells with no need for expansion in vitro and because we grow our organoids in the periphery of the wells we leave the center of the well completely empty and this allows us to um, use media changes and drug incubations uh, by using different liquid handles devices. So this is able to automation and this protocol is adaptable to multiple applications. So how we work is after the collection of the tumor sample, we digest the tumor sample and we seed the cells in the rim of the 96 well plate, leaving, as I said before, the center of the well completely empty and we just leave the organoids to grow uh, for some days and at day four and day five we perform the different drug treatments and at day six of the cell culture we are ready for the final assay. So with this project so far we were able to obtain two more organoids from 10 different patients presenting different ages and sex. Uh, nine were pheochromocytoma tumors and one was a paraganglioma tumor. Also the tumor sizes were different and none of them were metastatic and they presented different molecular types. So how we work is the tissue is collected in the University of Texas Health San Antonio and they ship the tissue to us in UCL where we grow the organoids for a short-term period, only six days. But in this project, we also wanted to explore longer cell culture conditions up to one month. And then we are able to perform different analyses as the um, organoid growth. We also are able to determine catecholamine secretion and expression in the supernatant of the organoids. We are doing this in collaboration of the University of Dresden in Germany. And of course, we can collect these organoids and perform histology and immunohistopathology. So here I show you the results of the drug screening that we perform using short and long term cell cultures of all these tumor organoids from different patients. We tried different drugs as you can see in the list above. Not only single agents but we can also test different drug combinations and you can see that the most of the drugs that we test are already approved by FDA, but we are also interested in trying new drugs that are still in clinical trials or in preclinical stages. And so this drug screening platform that we have in the lab reveals unique drug sensitivities and drug resistance in a personalized way. While the results that I show in the last slide were uh, for single dose drug treatments, we can also obtain those response graphs and also we can calculate the EC50 for each drug. So overall, our approach needs a very few number of cells with no need of passaging. And we establish our paraganglioma organoids that recapitulate parental tumor immunohistochemical profile, cell diversity, and secretion profiles. And our drug screening platform can identify unique functional profiles within only one week from tissue procurement, but we can also establish longer term cell cultures up to one month. And because of these organoids we can establish from fresh tissue but also frozen tissue, we are happy if other researchers want to use uh, this platform to perform similar um, drug screenings. And then I want just like to thank uh, my lab and of course uh, Patricia Daya lab in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you. I just thought I'd take a couple slides and I don't want to go into the biology so much as just talk about some of the challenges of animal models uh, and then uh, kind of what we're looking for. And so this group probably doesn't need convincing that animal models uh, are, are useful. And so, like I said, I'll go through the value and the challenges very quickly and I'll use the SDHB model as uh, that we've developed as kind of the platform. And then thinking about this animal subgroup, what I think should fall under this domain, and we'll have a discussion later on on others' uh, views. And then our 
at least my initial proposed criteria for, for how we should begin to, to group these models. And then, so why do we need a model? Obviously, we have a shared goal of, of, of treatments, and then these animal models really provide a, a unique way of watching the time course of tumor development that you can't use as easily with cell lines, and then also it, it has a relevant tumor environment. And then I think organoids definitely have their place, and I think the bulk of our discussion will be on organoids. That's why I'm taking time now for the animal models, but uh, the, I think that they have a, a unique role to play here. And then I think the overlying driving difficulty has been what's the right animal model? And obviously I think the rule is that there's no one model, but we have to um, be mindful of tracking the fidelity and uh, how predictable is the line, how soon do the tumors form, and then ideally be a spontaneous. So then using the SDH, and I'll go through this pretty quickly, what we know and other citric acid cycle mutations, we know that there's something called an oncometabolite, but in reality, we haven't actually been able to test this hypothesis very easily. But I think there's agreement that there are such things as oncometabolites. And the idea is that these things like succinate and fumarate, IDH, inhibit prole hydroxylases and cause HIF activation. And that's confirmed because you, with FIOs, you see HIF2 causes FIOs, VHL mutations cause FIOs. So it's, it's a nice hypothesis. It kind of feels good. But then there's this other side of the hypermethylation where we don't really know uh, what to make of that, but um, we see a promotion of histone hypermethylation and DNA hypermethylation. Uh, but actually testing this hypothesis has been hard to do in mice models. And so here I'm just listing on the left just a whole bunch of attempts at making SDH animals. So this has been tried for 20 years. And so we want to collect people's failed experiments but we should also be mindful that just because one person failed may not mean that the next effort doesn't do something slightly different. Uh, and at one point, thought, well, maybe this is impossible. Uh, and then our effort was to generate SDHB knockout mice. And because of the, all the failures and our concerns, we thought lineage tracing is really important. I think Don hit upon this. We should be mindful of using luciferase, using things that we can track cells. Of course, the SDHB knockouts don't get tumors, even when you wait until the end of their natural life course. But there still is value. Uh, these animals still have elevated succinate. So we knocked out SDH, cells are viable, no tumors, high succinate. So the oncometabolite hypothesis has its merits, but I think it's not a sufficient explanation. Again, then when you look deeply, the cells still have a very dramatic phenotype. Here on the yellow star, you can see there's very large expansion of mitochondria. That is actually what you see in the human SDH tumors. But we saw histone hypermethylation, but not DNA hypermethylation. So mechanistically, if you go back, DNA hypermethylation takes a lot of cell cycle. So it suggests that maybe SDH can re or high succinate or oncometabolites, maybe they play a reprogramming role, but there's a separate event that's gonna drive cells to replicate. Uh, and so we used a synthetic. So again, you'll see this a lot in cancer biology. It's okay to use synthetic drivers. It can teach you, but you have to be mindful that you're not doing the real thing. Uh, and then there's a synergistic interaction between SDH and NF here, and I'm not gonna go into why NF and why it worked and such, that, but, and the, still the phenotype is, is essentially there, uh, but now we see DNA hypermethylation. It's similar to the human, which is shown in the central panel, but the NF alone doesn't do this. So you're getting an SDH phenotype using a synthetic. So there's, again, there's, there's some value there. And then I don't really wanna go into this, but the idea is that we get a, a, this kind of in-between transcriptomic profile. It overlaps somewhat with the human tumors, but it's not the human tumors. So here, like when we talk about how, why are we having so much difficulty making our animal model? So oftentimes we can't globally knock out the drivers because the animals die. And then, like I said, there could be multiple things that are required. And so we have to think about that. And then one of the main limitations of mouse models is that we target individual genes, right? But in reality, that's not what happens. You get these loss of heterogosity and that's probably an event and so now we have to think about how do we start modeling these real genetic events that happen in the human tumors in our animal models. Animal models are challenging and it's hard to get people interested in this because it takes so long, right? So it's eight months, 10 months before anything happens. And so we have to think about how do we share a resource like that where we have enough animals available to people so that they can actually do uh, experiments. And then of course, funding is always an issue. All right. So when I was thinking about what should fall into the animal models, uh, I think the genetically engineered mouse models and other species, I think clearly fall within this. 
I think the xenografts, some of which can't be grown in culture, so won't fall into the cell line and, and organoid group, probably should come into our, our animal model territory. And then, uh, like I said, we're going to kind of leave the others to others. I, I, we'd like people to contribute, and we're trying to think about what are the key parameters to think about. So first is, what is the disease that you're actually trying to model? That's uh, obviously key. What is the, the anatomic lo location? Where is the cell origin or what cell type is it actually the tumor coming from? For instance, if you're doing insulinomas or if you're doing peanuts, which cell type are you targeting? I, I think that's critical. What are the functional status and the markers that you're using to validate that, that this tumor is human-like or has some corollary? And what are the genetic drivers that you're utilizing? I think here I should also have included what's the animal's genetic background because many of the models currently have different phenotypes depending upon what background they're on. And then the growth characteristics, so uh, we each know what to expect from our models. And then I also think, you know, when we write grants and we write papers, we tend to ignore all the truths that we know, right? And so these are important to share. <laughs> and to be open about at the, at the, you know, when we're ready to sit around at a table and be honest with each other. And um, again, strengths and, and weaknesses. Distribution is obviously a key criteria, but someone hopefully will raise their hand and say, yes, my model, you can contact me, this is how you get it. MTAs can be a little bit difficulty, but hopefully some funding source or something makes it possible for you to get it out of your university or, or your location. And then, of course, you know, published references, things that people who, when you transfer the model, that they can read and, and, and all the also little needle details. Okay, so that was it for, for, for my group. And I think, Don, are you going to? You know, where do we have deficits and what kind of solutions or action items can we start pursuing? Um, and so we just wanted to open it up to all of you because if we can, one idea was that we develop a Google Doc and we get everybody to participate and to add their information into it and everybody can then benefit from it and you can, you can put in everything that you're working on and that you're willing to, to try and share and hopefully it's even uh, if we can get negative data or weird stuff that happens in your animal model or something else uh, somehow added to this data sheet, uh, not only the successes and, and the good stuff that works, but hopefully we don't want people repeating uh, and, and trying to redo stuff that others have already found was not going to work because um, it's time and money and effort. And so, yeah, what do you all think? <laughs> Hi, hello. I have an idea and, and a suggestion. You know, um, these these organs that contain these neuroendocrine cells are really heterogeneous, and so how do you get to these cells if your ultimate goal is to kind of engineer cancers? And uh, I, I submit that an example is uh, an organ, a, a program that was formed by Nat Heinz at Rockefeller University. It's called GenSat. It took bacterial art official chromosomes for 6,000 neuronal promoters and he, he put GFP in front of them and they just screened to find different kinds of neurons. This revolutionized neuroscience, modern innovative neurosciences and from that we got we got crees, we got uh, um, uh, ribosomal trapping, we got all these things that were cell type specific so that you could interrogate different circuitry and I, I've spoken to that and I said, said, you know, you have all these neuroendocrine specific promoter mice, you're lighting up the brain in all these different ways were there any neuroendocrine cells that lit up? He goes, oh, I got a whole stack of them in this desk here, and I, I just didn't know what to do with them. So I submit that we form a group, and we go to Nat Heinz, my students joining his lab, and we say, you know, let's get something together where we can sort through the promoters that you've made and get to set, uh, small cells better. Let's get to uh, endochromophin cells better. Let's see if we can get to these populations a little better. We, we, it, once we have that, uh, then we can, uh, we can get crease in there, and we'll, we'll be able to do, uh, we'll be able to knock out genes, we'll be able to express uh, uh, click chemistry tools, we'll be able to get CRISPR uh, uh, to be very specific in these cell populations. And as you see, this I, I think the sequencing and single cell that's going on is great, 
but it's going to give us a whole nother level of, of targets and a whole nother group of specific cells in which to manipulate. And so, you know, just trying to make these mutations over and over again and see how many mutations we have to get to get them in there, I think is, is a kind of a crude approach if we can get to more uh, cell type specificity in, the, in our manipulations. And so I, I think if we really want to make models, we have to take a couple steps back and say, how do we get our, how do we get these specific cells in a state where we can manipulate them? I, I, I submit that. I, I just uh, want to follow up and say I, I really like that idea, and it's also something, I mean, you talked about single cell, but for example, I have a model system I didn't talk about at all where I can generate normal pulmonary neuroendocrine cells, and I've done single cell RNA sequencing, and we see heterogeneity. So now we're mining that data set to get to look exactly for markers so that we can target those different subpopulations. And there are single cell RNA sequencing data sets coming out. There are multiple now for intestinal and endocrine cells. I think there's there's also data there to be mined and promoters to look at. And maybe there will be parallels between, you know, there's also pancreatic uh, endocrine cell uh, data sets. And so maybe combining your, the approach you're suggesting and also the data that's out there and trying to figure out what, you know, what makes sense? What, what are the populations that make sense to look at? And are there already promoters uh, or tools available for some of those markers? Like you said, I've always thought about this, you know, in, in, the, in the neuroscience field, I, I feel like they have, maybe already established so many tools. And many of these markers are also found in neuroendocrine cells. So let's translate some of those tools and apply them to neuroendocrine and see what we can do. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of mutations that don't make tumors. But if we had these kind of cell type specific approaches, we could start to be asking, what is the physiological state of these cells? And then what's the kickers that kick them off towards uh, uh, tumors. We can get so much information without having to actually make tumors if we, we get the right mutations in the right cells with the right kind of uh, 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 biosensors to detect what's going on. So just a general comment. I mean, I think that this is really a great initiative. Um, if there is a need for prioritization, and I think that a certain point you guys will need to prioritize, I think that, you know, like, the thing is not just to reply to all research questions. I think it's to reply to the right research questions. And I think that we really should look at that, like, if we really want to improve, like, our field, if we want to improve the survival of med patients, we should look at this, like, from a clinical perspective. So, you know, like, what are the areas of a med clinical need? Neuroendocrine carcinomas? Basically, we do not have any treatment apart the uh, chemo. Lung carcinoids. So you know, like even like in this consortium, it would be great to see our prioritization based on the clinical need of the patients and not just the science. Yeah. Science is great, but you know, like to improve <coughs> clinical outcomes, we need to focus on the clinical needs. I think we have a lot of common goals, uh, but yet the models may be very different and the diseases may be very different. Uh, so the questions might be very unique to specific models. And, and this is a really good opportunity as, as a group, as a consortium, to try and delineate those, those goals for different models, right? So we are asking different things. Uh, and, and this is, I think, a very good segue to the, the previous comment that we need to know what our priorities are for each group. And of course, we cannot tackle them all uh, with a single model. And, and I think that part of the goals of, a, of this consortium will be, what can we hope to answer with, with the different models? Because they are configured differently. And for different diseases, the main questions are gonna be slightly different. So there's not one single uh, model that will uh, answer all the questions, nor are the questions the same for every model. So I just wanted to uh, point that out and maybe a white paper by this group or something, even the definition, the nomenclature that we all, <laughs> uh, we, we talked about this uh, morning and, 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 and now in the session as well. So how do we define our models, right? What What is the definition? I think this is a really good group to try and come up with uh, uh, such definitions. So, yeah, I was just going to say that I think we all agree that as when we start to think about this consortium, we're going to need priority areas. But I think we also are aware that 
there are going to be a lot of priority areas. So I think that was part of the divvying up into subgroups. So each subgroup themselves will have a different priority. But I think that is going to be further divided into the sort of tissue or the cell type you're interested in as well. And I think that's one of the things you have to hash out, that is almost how do we divvy up the groups to make the most progress to prioritise. And that's, I think, depending on who gets involved in the consortium, that's how we're going to move forward quickly and sort of more efficiently. And then to speak to that point of it's great to divvy up into subgroups, but at the same time, can somebody who's working on paraganglioma actually learn from something that people have been doing on another type of net? And so we don't want to divvy ourselves up so much that we're not getting crosstalk amongst the groups. So that was kind of the thinking is that we have an umbrella set of the cell lines, the organoids or the oid group, and then, and then the animal models. And then hopefully there could be, you know, you've got your subgroups that work in the area that they are specifically expert in. And then uh, perhaps then you have yearly meetings where you're all getting together and saying, this is the progress or this is an area that we're trying to work on or this is what we've learned from attempts and, and hopefully we can accelerate the progress for everybody. That we actually, that's why Bioscientifica are getting involved. So it's going to guarantee these annual meetings, we will be able to publish a white paper for each of our like main subgroups from each meeting. So the information will be being put out constantly like every year on how we're sort of moving forward. And we're not gonna be able to put all the consensus statements out in one paper. So each year we would say like maybe year one will focus on terminology. So are we talking about spheroids, organoids? or whatever other roids we can think of before the next meeting. And so we kind of focus on key points and that will mean that everyone's kept in the loop with everything and who's doing what. So no one loses track of, you know, the general sort of theme of it all. Is anybody working on patient derived stem cells as the, the beginning source and rather than tumor cells? Human, yes, in fact, yes. Were you doing some of that? I am. <laughs> is there some advantage to, to taking that step back rather than having to wait for someone's tumors just to, to be able to yeah I mean I think so uh, but I also think you know like we've, we've said probably multiple ways the, we're, they're complementary approaches right and we're gonna try to cover them all very few are published at this point um, directed differentiation protocols are, are available for, for a variety of lineages uh, we haven't introduced that as a group, but where would that fall? I agree. That's a good idea. A, a good question. Maybe that's under cell lines. Maybe it's under the oids, depending upon how you grow them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I was wondering, um, what is your position on uh, animal models other than mice? For example, there is uh, what seems to me like a promising uh, model of SDH and zebrafish that don't fail. Yeah, so then you get it. I mean, I think this is a kind of thing that comes in the discussion. I mean, I have my, my views. <laughs> um, and so I think at this point, it's an animal model question. Whether or not you can model human tumors in Saccharomyces, I don't know. Um, but I think there are, there are definitely people uh, who think that's important information you can get, and then that should be, you know, where does the phylogeny start? I, I agree, that's an important question. If everyone could get involved and participate in some way, I think we'll all benefit. Um, it may not be apparent immediately, but I think with time, we're going to help each other out. Um, and I love the, I, the fact that Bioscientifica is involved and, and would help publish white papers. Um, we can think about also uh, just having guidelines amongst ourselves being really helpful. Um, and also, we haven't really touched on sharing, but it is a big issue, and they're especially patient-derived samples. Um, if we try and work together on that, I think we'll make some headway. Some, some institutions have it streamlined, and if they're willing to share their language, um, it may help other institutions, so that probably needs to be a whole nother subgroup, right? <laughs> Donna? 
I just yeah, want to add that uh, maybe sharing the contact person to uh, get to try to, to get access to even this MTA would be very valuable because many of us like try to find a contact person and sometimes you know people leave institution or they change jobs and then it, it becomes like very difficult so maybe on the, the spreadsheet the giant spreadsheet if we can have like that column there that would be very nice it was definitely a motivating feature especially as people just try and, and try and share the cell lines they were generated a long time ago and you ask and you're like no I can't send them I said I wouldn't send them so then people try and contact the originator and they don't respond or they've moved or they retired and so it becomes this kind of bad loop and if we can fix it and maybe have a central resource if people are willing to do that um, so you know that's another idea is centralizing some of these resources not for not for organoids or, or tumoroids or spheroids likely because that is is going to be transient I think unless you get the higher grade and neck like, right? Well, my lung nets are long term. So those right, are like so cell the lines. long term ones. So those, you yes. can. Yeah. But the if they're short term, yeah. That's right. I think the broad has a couple that are available. They're longer term, but long term, I, I need to understand what that definition is of long term because I'm not sure that it really <laughs> means that they're sustainable. but. Yeah, I, I guess when I'm using it, I mean they're sustainable. So that's why okay. I say the SI nets, I got to passage four, mm -hmm. but that's that not past passage four. So that for me is not, it's no longer yeah. an organoid, uh, has the potential mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. to be an organoid. But then my lung net lines, I didn't see a stopping point. So they made it past passage four and haven't stopped yet. To the best of my knowledge, in culture more than a year, they likely won't stop, although for, for peanuts, it's interesting. We're, 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 you're really trying to do the same thing that people are trying to come up with treatments for type 2 diabetes. How can you get these cells to grow so that you can get enough insulin produced in, in your body? And uh, um, the guy that I work with, Laurent Mayer, has a new DERP 1A inhibitor going into clinical trials for Down syndrome. But it's, uh, you know, the point is, is if you give it to mice for five days, they make all these beta islet cells. I'm, I'm happy to introduce you to Laurent. Maybe you could use his drugs, and all of a sudden, your cells would just kind of take off like like they do in. in they don't. They don't. So, so my my other identity <laughs> is beta cell proliferation and <laughs> okay. drug discovery and Dirk One A targeting. So we, we, we do a, we do a lot of that. <laughs> See, so that is the point of this discussion. It's great idea and no. It's but not but I, I, I recommend you try it. There's lots of widely available DERP <laughs> 1A inhibitors. Just because it doesn't work in my lab doesn't mean. I want to follow up on something Don said a few minutes ago about how things that are happening right now could be beneficial. You know, we won't see it right away, but it'll come back. And as someone who runs a chemistry lab and has uh, been holding on for dear life with the talks today, but learned a lot. Uh, I think it's important to understand from, from, I guess from both disciplines, as you guys are developing these cell lines and understanding what's going on at the mRNA level and ultimately, you know, with the ultimate goal of having some kind of actionable target, right? That's what we want to go to, a biomarker. So uh, as we understand these things, we could apply either established tools for imaging, whether it's radioactive, fluorescence, known agents, or develop customized you know, imaging strategies. So it's kind of cool, I think, to see this happening, and it's encouraging. So we're kind of waiting. We have techniques. We have toolkits that can be applied as well. So if you decide something is potentially a druggable target, a thera therapeutic target, uh, very standard imaging tools that can be applied to assess those and examine them right, you know, early on. Yeah, so Ali Osdarinia, I, I think that's a really great point. And maybe we don't have enough in here. We don't even have a section about, you know, where do we fit in people from the imaging or from the chemistry and targeting side. But we, we need We're way downstream. We need you in the conversation though, because that also comes around to prioritizing and maybe guiding what we choose to do. I think that you can be in all the different models, right? <laughs> you, can be you can be in all the groups. So I just want to say there's some very basic things that I think we're looking at that, that have come up from some of the comments. Nomenclature, 
and I think archiving is really important. How do we how do we classify these different groups? What are the key characteristics that we use to define these different groups? And I think being able to catalog them, which is I think what we ultimately want to do, is have a catalog of these lines that the community can see and use and figure out what those things are. So we need a group, a subgroup that's going to be devoted to gnomes, for example, nomenclature or defining those characters and working within themselves to try and uh, determine those kinds of things. I think there's other kinds of, uh, what we want to also try and do is encourage the progress of this consortium by really kind of taking the low hanging fruit approach in terms of what kind of deliverables can we achieve reasonably in a short amount of time. So you have long term and you have short term. And I think Dawn is saying it's going to take a long time for a lot of things to be figured out, but let's concentrate on some first steps and some first uh, first groups that we want to try and organize the two different types of models into uh, just to get started. And I think once we get those lines, those uh, groups established and people in, uh, interested in participating in them, then I think some of the other, they'll start falling into even more groups after that. But. Uh, uh, just as a getting started point, I think that's kind of what I wanted to get out for this meeting here. I just have a, a, a couple of uh, things to say. One is just I want to obviously thank all of our participants that are up here, uh, uh, moderators and, and speakers, for contributing to uh, the, the really nice summary. I mean, there's a lot of models that uh, uh, are really out there. And so being able to know which ones to use and when to use them and what assays you can do with them, what are they good for, and importantly, which ones are they not good for uh, is really important. Defining things like short-term, long-term. And then the biological question, how do we get them short-term or long-term uh, to do what we want them to do? So I think all of those things are really important. Um, and uh, have a nice evening. And we'll see you tomorrow. Right.